This week we're talking about mission patches. We've all seen them. Most of us probably own a patch as well. Sometimes they end up becoming icons, and we want to know all about how they're designed and made. And to do this, we talked to Tim Gagnon, who has been designing mission patches for years and has had a number of his designs become official mission patches. If ever there was an expert in their field, Tim is that. Please continue to get in touch with your thoughts on what we're up to. We're at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Or leave a review on your podcast platform. And don't forget to hit that share button as well. It really helps us out. But right now, please enjoy episode 52 of the Space and Things podcast. You're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 52. It's good to be back, Emily. It's good to be back. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. We've already recorded an episode about uh, my Houston experience. I won't spoil it too much because uh, I just got back from there, but it was awesome. But we'll talk about that in that future episode. So don't miss that. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you at the start of this episode all about that, but then I realized we spent all of last night talking about it and... We don't need to again. It's coming up in a future episode, everyone. But yeah, episode 52. Can you believe it? It's crazy, right? I know. Next week will surpass a year, which is insane to me. Like, And we've accomplished so much within that year, which is amazing. So I'm very proud of what we've done of both of us. It's really awesome. Me too. Me too. It doesn't feel like a year either, does it? No, it doesn't. It feels like we just got started like last week or something like that. I was thinking the same. So I, I'd like to call this the final final episode of year one. I was thinking, I was thinking, Emily, about how, how we should celebrate this. And it dawned on me a couple of months ago, I, I need to get planning this. This is a big deal, right? So I was like, we should get a patch designed. Yes. It just yes. made sense. Mm-hmm. And you know what, Emily, I don't think I've told you this. My original plan was every week the artwork of the episode would be a new patch. A weekly patch when we didn't know even what the subject was until quite late for some of them was never going to happen. So (laughs) I always had it in my head that at some point we would have a patch and I thought for a year it'd be perfect. And I knew I knew the man to ask. So uh, Tim Gagnon is a bit of a legend in the space world and his designs are just incredible. Um, So he's he has designed a patch for us. And if you're one of our Patreons, you'll be receiving this shortly. Uh, and if you're not, you can sign up and get one. Or just head to our website and buy one. It's a, it's a really special thing to be able to say, we have a patch. Yes, it's really awesome. Uh, Tim obviously does a beautiful job. Uh, Tim really is amazing. And it's great that we're able to talk to him today about his process and how he got into this business. So enjoy. Okay, I'll fly control. Keep watching your data. I'm still going to be asking for a go to go here in about four minutes. Tim, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about patches. So you've been doing this for a while now. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us your origin story? How d- does one become a patch designer? How did you become a patch designer? Well, yeah, I, I'm sure mine is not uh, the typical origin story. Uh when uh, I was 16, I got to see the launch of Apollo 17, uh, December of 1972. And it was at that launch that when I saw the Apollo 17 patch that I learned that it was created by an artist that didn't work for NASA or, you know, one of the contractors like North American or anything and became aware for the first time that outside artists sometimes have this opportunity. So, of course, this was this was what I wanted to do. You know, you'll never, I'm not a right main kind of guy. You don't want me to calculate uh, trajectories because you will definitely be lost in space. <laughs> I'm the <But> same. <laughs> if, if you want to wear a good looking patch on your spacesuit, then I can help you out. <laughs> so uh, in the next year, 1973, there was an article in Analog Magazine written by Frank Kelly Freeze. And up until that time that I saw that article, I knew his work from Spider-Man. He, he mm. did artwork for Spider-Man for Marvel Comics. 
among other things, but that's what I was aware of. And so in that magazine article, he laid it all out. It was like a set of blueprints. He worked with uh, Joe Kerwin uh, from the first Skylab increment crew. And in the article, he explained the entire process of how he got some guidance about what Skylab was going to be, what the mission goals were. And so he started making sketches and sending it back and forth. And eventually, you know, the process narrows it down to become the Skylab, the first Skylab, the one slash two crew patch. And I said, well, this is perfect. You know, all I got to do is follow these directions and I'll be set. <laughs> So I started writing to astronauts, and uh, they were always very gracious. Uh, the first opportunity came during the second increment when Alan Bean's crew was up there, and uh, their service module developed a leak in the reaction control system. And so NASA had made plans for a rescue, and now they started implementing those plans. And they chose a crew, Vance Brand and Don Lind, to fly the rescue mission. And so I wrote to Vance Brand and I sent him a couple of drawings and I said, you know, I would love to design your mission patch. I didn't hear anything for a while. And by the time I heard back, they had developed the workaround and the, uh, and the artwork wasn't needed. The mission never flew. Fast forward to 2017 and I meet Vance Brand and his wife at Space Fest. And I said, sir, you have no reason to remember this. You know, it was 44 years prior. Uh, but in 1973, I sent you artwork for the Skylab rescue mission. His wife spoke up and said, I know exactly where that is. And apparently he never threw anything away because <laughs> a couple months later, they mailed me back the original drawings I did in 1973. No way. And, uh, and I hadn't seen that artwork in all that time. And, uh, and that's how it started. And I just kept writing to astronauts and, and was very kindly turned down by Tom <laughs> Stafford and Bob Crippen and all these guys. And then eventually in 2004, John Phillips chose me to work on the Expedition 11 patch. So my overnight success only took 31 years. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I love this story. Um, so let's talk, you, you touched on it a little bit. Um, you talked mm -hmm. about, you had, um, in the 1980s, you had a, a, you did design some patches for shuttle missions. Uh, some mm -hmm. of those missions, unfortunately, didn't even fly because of Challenger. Tell us a little bit about yeah. that and about, you know, um, you, you did have some communication with Bob Crippen and, uh, tell, tell us a little bit about what you were doing at that time. Sure. Well, I was working, uh, for the state of Connecticut and uh, as a logistics engineer in the military department but i you know kept my hands in at, with uh, you know paying attention to the shuttle program as well as you could from connecticut which was not exactly you know the hub of space news and uh and i learned that they were planning to launch a mission from vandenberg air force base you know put discovery uh, in orbit in a polar orbit around the earth and I said, oh, this is cool. You know, they had never launched a shuttle from Vandenberg. And so I started, you know, devouring Aviation Week and space technology and learning all I could about the mission. And I learned that Bob Crippen, uh, who had graciously turned me down for STS-1, was going to command. And so I wrote to him and I said, sir, you know, we never got to connect on STS-1. And I understand, I mean, Bob McCall designed that patch, and I'm no Bob McCall. And uh, he said, well, let's see what you got. You know, and he invited me to submit some artwork. And I came up with four designs and, uh, and sent them off. And, of course, you know, we don't get instant email responses back in those days. Uh, and so I eventually got a letter back that the mission was canceled after Challenger. But at least an astronaut had invited me to submit some artwork. So I, I viewed that as progress. You know, ironically enough, in 20, I want to say 14, 15 ish, I polished up the artwork and had a small set of patches made of those four designs. And it was through that effort that I learned that Bob Crippen had a favorite. And, uh, and so, okay, 
now we're making progress some more. And this past year with the pandemic, I reached out to uh, Patrick Mullane and his father through him uh, via Facebook. And I was also Facebook friends with Jerry Ross, and they were had both been selected for that crew. And I said, I've always wanted to see what would happen if we could have finished this design. And we took the, the one that Crip liked the most, and I said, now, I need your feedback the same way you guys have always worked with artists. And we came up with a finished STS-62A patch. And I unveiled it at this past Space Fest. And uh, Mike Mullane's wife just absolutely loved it. And, and even Crip sent me an email saying, you know, great looking patch. I wish we could have used it. Yeah. But it was nice That's to awesome. kind of close that circle from 1985 and, uh, and make it come to a, a, a successful completion. Man, that's such a great story. Yeah, if I could only get For All Mankind to put it on their show, it'd be <sighs> awesome. Yeah, That would be awesome. <laughs> so that you guys need awesome. to interview the people behind that show. <laughs> well, yeah. I'll send, I'll send them an email. <laughs> send them an there email. You go. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of off topic. I'm hoping in one of the future seasons they have like a space and things man because they got to have a podcast eventually <laughs> yeah i mean come so on. they have a i'm hoping they have a oh, space and things amazing. that would be hysterical i'd be like i think they used us oh my god that's okay yeah. but still well the week we could have a lot of fun with that yeah so you've established that uh, artists work with astronauts in order to finalize a design and some of these designs obviously have become iconic as, as you know, instantly recognizable. Well, that's the patch from this mission, so on and so forth. I understand the crew are proud of their patches and things like that and, and, and wear them proudly on their flight suits. Why do you think the public love patches so much? When I was a kid and I went to Kennedy Space Center for the first time, I came back with loads of A4 sticky paper that had all the all the patches on of that had flown up until that point. I loved them. I just mm -hmm. loved going through them and trying to learn the names and memorize what they look like for each mission. What, what, what do you think, as someone who's designed them, I mean, and obviously you fell in love with that art as well, what do you think it is about a mission patch that really captures the imagination of the public? Well, mission patches, really, if, if you trace the, uh, the uh, history, can be traced all the way back to you know the 1100s with coats of arms on shields and of course. you know it's a it's a piece of artwork that represents a group of people working together on a project that means a lot to them and you know and then you know fast forward uh, to the 20th century you got the military organizations you have unit crests you have artwork on the side of airplanes you have uh, squadron patches and of course all these uh original astronauts came from the military and i thank goodness for gordo cooper because he convinced nasa to allow them to have a, a patch for gemini 5 he said, you know, we should have a patch to represent this mission and represent the people that worked on this mission. And eventually, you know, they I don't know how long it took them to wear down NASA, but they approved it. And uh, and I, I'm grateful that he did. And then after Gemini 5, patches were not it was illegal for a person like me to own them because I didn't work for NASA or I didn't work for a contractor. The public was not allowed to purchase patches until like 1969 1970 wow it was actually wow. against the law but it becomes a, a symbol of you know maybe you know as a kid you went to that launch or or you know maybe your uncle worked on that shuttle mission and it it's it's a souvenir of a time when you did something larger than yourself and, you know, you got to hand it to the artist, not to pat myself on the back too much, because there are lots of uh, impressive artists. They really try to make them very good looking, very beautiful, tiny pieces of art. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think that was a good time, actually, to uh, bring up your first commission. That must have been a huge moment for you. 
I haven't <laughs> tried for years. I mean, we spoke to Clay Anderson yeah. recently about how, how being rejected to become an astronaut for years, but I suppose it's a similar thing. After 31 years of trying to get that that phone call or that letter or whatever it was, saying, "Yeah, can can you yeah. can you work with us on this?" How did that feel? Oh, it was it was amazing. I you know I almost pinched myself because you know I had come close and it didn't work out and I almost it was almost like gee I don't want to jinx this mission <laughs> if I work on their patch they might get canceled who knows <laughs> but uh no it was very nice uh that uh, he uh, John Phillips was the uh flight engineer for Expedition 11 and he's the one that invited me uh to work with them his commander was Sergey Krikalov and uh they I did some research independently and, and tried to understand, okay, what's Expedition 11 all about? And then they provided uh, great feedback and, and ideas that, okay, we would we like this kind of thing, we like that. Uh, matter of fact, um, if you look at that patch, uh, there is a symbol that shows from the uh, launch to the number one, and it's actually a very – stylized Greek letter alpha. Sergey was part of the Expedition One crew when they requested the call sign alpha for the station. And uh, and they got into a little bit of trouble about that because, you know, this was not the first space station that the Russians had been involved with. And NASA was worried about upsetting the Russians that, uh, you know, all right, you guys can use it for a call sign, but it never really caught on. Nobody calls the station Alpha anymore. But on Expedition 11, they wanted that symbol to represent that little bit of history. And so that symbol, that stylized letter, because it doesn't really look like a stylized Alpha letter, um, stayed in the patch. But that was uh, a, a request from Sergey. That's awesome. Were there any um, challenges or any sort of gotchas about working that you can speak about working on the Expedition 11 patch? Uh, I'm glancing up at it right now. Um, not really. I mean, I was just I, I was not going to, you know, rock the boat too much. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You, you know, you say jump. I say how high. Yeah. Whatever they wanted, I was going to give it to them. And uh, but I was just, you know in awe that I got the chance to do it. Finally, after all this time, you know, I'm getting emails back and forth and they like some of my suggestions and all that kind of stuff. Matter of fact, the, the way the space station looks on that patch was based on a drawing that I did. I actually traced it <laughs> uh, from probably aviation week magazine. And, uh, and they liked that illustration better than an idea that they had had. And uh, so they adopted that specifically. But on that patch, you know, the, the sky is navy blue, which is nothing specific. I mean, it's not navy blue because John was in the Navy, uh, but they just didn't want black. They thought black was too dark. And there's like 15 stars on that patch. Now, usually stars up until that point were like, all right, your expedition six, you got six stars, that kind of thing. Well, 15, I mean, they just liked the way it looked. It was, and there's no recognizable continents on the earth. You know, all the green on the earth is, is just a bunch of, you know, shapes. And so it, it was not anything really deliberate. They just, they liked what they saw and they, and they knew what it was when they saw it, that, you know, that this is going to be it. And it was, it was just like that. So you say it's just like that, but I imagine this is a long process. How how long does it take? Uh, I started working with John in the spring, and I submitted my last piece of artwork in September. Wow, of two thousand and four, wow. and uh, and then it you know once the crew approved of the design, then it gets kicked up to NASA management, you know, because they look at these things to make sure there's nothing hidden. They're not trying to get away with anything. <laughs> and, you know, uh, so once it got approved, then it gets turned over to the, the Johnson Space Center graphics team and they polish up the artwork. And 
there was some changes between what I submitted in September and what John emailed me in December of 2004, but he said it still looks enough like what you created that you can proudly claim ownership. And uh, I mean, like I was doing, I was not sophisticated. I'm still not sophisticated. Don't get me wrong. But I did, when I cut and paste, like that drawing of the station, I drew it on cardstock, pen and ink and all that. Then I cut it out and I glued it to the blue background. So cut and paste was cutting and pasting. <laughs> <laughs> I got Helvetica letters for the names of the crew. And I had to reshape, you know, U.S. Helvetica stick-on letters to look like Cyrillic letters uh, to oh, wow. form Krikalov because they wanted his name in, in Cyrillic. And so if you looked at that uh, last piece of artwork that I submitted and the final design, yeah, you could definitely see a difference. Uh, Terry Johnson was the guy that polished up the work and uh, he did an awesome job. We're going to shift uh, gears a little bit and I wanted to we wanted to talk a little bit about um, the commemoratives. You're, you're really well known also, not just for mission patches, but also for commemorative patches, you know, commemorating uh, mission anniversaries and, you know, certain milestones and space history and things like that. Uh, what got you started on that? And those have a big fan base as well. I have a lot of your commemoratives. So can you talk a little bit about that? Like you did a X-15 one, for example. And uh, to my knowledge, the mm -hmm. X-15 program didn't have any patches, but it's cool to have a commemorative patch just to, you know, to have that if you're really into that program, you know, and I love sure, the sure. X-15. And, and I appreciate that. And a, a little a little bit of announcement that you guys can break to the world. Yes. I'm putting out a new X-15 patch uh, this fall. Nice. Oh wow! And it, it's new, improved artwork, and it's gonna. And I like it even better than the original. The original one, the original X15, was designed on Microsoft Word. <laughs> oh wow! Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. I mean, when you can go into Microsoft Paint and add shapes and fill in the colors and all that, that's how that X15 patch was designed. Wow. And uh, and this other one is is much better. And I'm looking forward to it uh, because the uh, the first X-15 flight uh, was actually on my birthday. I think I was uh, I don't know, one or two years old when Scott Crossfield flew uh, the powered flight. Uh, and so I figured, well, that's it's it's due for uh, an update. And uh, but the Expedition 11 patch was done in 2004 on my end of it. It was released in 2005, and then I didn't get the chance to work on another mission patch until 2008. So I've got those years where, you know, I'm not hearing back from crews yet. You know, I'm not known. And so I said, well, what? I mean, I love doing this kind of artwork, so what can I do? And I came up with an idea of celebrating NASA's 50th anniversary in 2008. And I did a commemorative for that. And, uh, and then the X-15s. And then I said, well, you know, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, they deserve to have some, you know, you, you've seen my work. You know I like big patches. Mm -hmm. My patches could be either on the back of your jacket or they could be a dinner plate. <laughs> you know, <laughs> encased in acrylic. I mean, they're they're massive, and nobody had done that up until that point, or it was very very rare. So I said, how can I celebrate the entire program uh, with a patch? And then you know, I came up with a design, and uh, and I started working with Jorge uh, in 2007, and uh, and so we've been just having a lot of fun doing it ever since. And the, the thing is, people are always surprised when well, I get asked a lot, where do you get your inspiration? Well, the space program dumps inspiration in barrelfuls mm -hmm. all over us every day. I mean, you know, you're a writer, Emily. I mean, how many times have you gotten an idea for a piece for your blog or, or for a magazine article or something because you heard a story and you needed to investigate that story? 
and you wrote something uh right now actually yeah yeah <laughs> the, the, just this week pretty much sure sure i mean the space program is very very generous on inspiration so you know that's that's always been the easiest thing for me is where do i come up with ideas yeah, I do have a suggestion. The approach and landing test when they uh, have their 45th anniversary, they need a patch. They need a commemorated. I'm just dropping that. <laughs> Consider it done, Emily. Tim's like, oh, no. And it will, and it will be unveiled on Space and Things. Oh, perfect. We'd, awesome. we'd love to do that. Awesome. We'd love to do that. We'll get awesome. Fredo back for it. There you go. There you go. I yeah, like that idea. Yeah, there it is. So I, I just want to pick up on something you said there. Uh, Expedition 11, 2004, launch 2005. Then there's a gap. After you did that patch, you must have been thinking, oh, it will be easier now. Well, not really, because growing up, you know, Bob McCall was the exception to the rule, but researching uh, uh, the artists that did, you know, Gemini patches and Apollo patches, they did one, maybe two patches, and then that was it. Mm. I mean, nobody knows or very few people, let me put it this way, today know who Barbara Matelski is. Well, she worked on a couple of patches, including Apollo 16. Wow. That's her artwork. Oh, wow. Now, she worked with the crew, and they, you know, crews always have a lot of feedback. It's, it's never been a situation where the artist dictated to the crew, all right, here is your mission patch. It's, it's, it's a collaboration, and, and I guess one of the reasons I've, been as fortunate as I have is that I remember that while I make suggestions based on my experience, it's not my patch. Mm. It's their patch. So they make all the decisions. But I didn't know if it would ever happen again. Matter of fact, when Jorge congratulated me uh, when the patch was posted in collectspace.com, uh, I, you know, shared a little bit about, you know, the story of how it came to be. And he wrote to me, he sent me an email congratulating me and asked and, and saying that this was something he had always dreamed of doing as well. And I said, I don't know if it's ever going to happen again, but if we get asked by another crew, why don't we collaborate? And in 2008, we got contacted by the Endeavor crew for STS-126. And I said, okay, Jorge, you come up with a design based on only what you know about the mission. I'll do the same thing and we'll send them both to the crew. And there were things in both designs that they liked. And, you know, we collaborated and, and successfully worked with that crew on 126. And then they recommended us to 127. And then they recommended us to 129. <laughs> you know, so it, you know, that happened for a while there where astronauts were writing to me. <laughs> I mean, I'm wow. still this shy kid from Hartford, Connecticut, saying they're writing to me, you know, seeking me out. You know, this is madness. That's incredible. That's awesome. That's so cool. That's awesome. So let's talk a little bit about what is the your fa your personal favorite patch that you've designed, and which patch do you wish you had? Do you see, and you're like, man, I wish I had done that. Oh, well, favorites are tough because, you know, and I'm sure you've had other people write, uh, have similar responses that each one is almost like a child. You know, <laughs> they each have their own special memories attached. And, uh, but the story behind the STS-133 patch is very special. Now, STS-133, when that crew was announced, they were going to be the final shuttle mission. 134 and 135 had not been manifested yet. And so as the final shuttle crew, they turned to Robert McCall to design their patch, which, you know, made perfect sense. He did STS-1. He did a couple in other ones besides that. So have him do the bookends, STS-1 and, and 133. And he was happy as a clam to, um, to create some artwork for them. And he mailed it out on a Friday to the crew. You know, it was two watercolor, beautiful, absolutely beautiful watercolor ideas for a patch. And he passed away Saturday morning. He was 90 years old. And the crew knew about him passing before they even got the package. Oh, wow. And they said, well, that, that's it. We're never going to get Robert McCall to do this patch. 
And then Monday morning, they get, you know, this package in the mail and it's from Robert McCall and they are, they're opening up the last artwork he ever created. Oh my. Wow. And Eric Bow was the pilot of that flight 133 but he was also our point of contact for 126 so he said to the crew why don't we just get tim and jorge to finish this and it, yeah, it was like being handled handed the the uh michelangelo's paintbrush by the pope <laughs> saying here finish the ceiling oh my god <laughs> that scared the crap out of me <laughs> i mean i i don't want to mess with it you know, but, you know, obviously it wasn't finished work. It still had it to be polished a little bit. And there were some things they wanted to change, but uh, it was uh, it, that one remains as a very special memory. Uh, but I really can't say it's my favorite because, you know, all of them have great stories and and memories of working with those crews. Uh, so but as far as one that I wish I created. I wish I could I could create as well as Blake Dumas know. Blake is a fantastic graphic artist in, in Houston, and I am in awe of his work all the time. My favorite one of his, uh, he created for, during the 30, uh, Expedition 37, there were three shuttle crews at the station for a short time, and I think it was the last crew that, to launch carried up the uh, the uh, Olympic torch that was going to be in Sochi in 2012. And so they had the Olympic torch on the space station for a short time. And then the crews revolved and and the, the oldest shuttle crew that was due to leave soon anyway returned it to Earth. And Blake worked with that crew, created an awesome patch, very limited edition. I wish I could get my hands on it but there just weren't very many made. And I absolutely love that piece of work. That's awesome. Okay. Dave, do you have any further questions? Yes, actually I do. Now, Tim, you've mentioned a number of other space patch artists over this interview. And it's got me thinking, you said that the patch belongs to the crew, although you are the artist, it's very much their patch. But do you think uh, that the artist should get more recognition. Do you think you and your colleagues um, should get a bit more, I don't want to use the word exposure, but do you think more should be done to show who it has actually been involved in designing a patch? Or do you think that the anonymity of it is just part of the job? No, it's really part of the job. I mean, because you have to understand these are projects that artists would pay their, you know, right arm to get to do. I mean, when the shuttle program was ending, crews were inundated with ideas from a lot of people. And, you know, if they chose, you know, somebody like me, that means they respected what I could do. Plus they also knew that I, I, I wasn't, you know, a diva about it. You know, this is my patch, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and dictating yeah. terms and so forth. Uh, so, but the thing is 500 years from now, somebody does some type of a search for the expedition 11 patch or expedi uh, you know, STS 129 or one of the missions I worked on the artwork that I helped create will still be attached to that mission. And I I know all the other artists that I've met personally, you know, like Mark Pastana and and uh, you know all these other guys. They all feel the same way. We're we're not just creating something that's you know on display. I like to say that my art gallery is orbiting the Earth at seventeen thousand miles an hour, mm. and but eventually that art gallery is going to get burned up on reentry. <laughs> so that's gonna that's gonna go away. But those pieces of art are going to always be attached to those missions. And I, you know, my great, 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 great grandsons or daughters are going to be able to say my ancestor helped create that patch. Ah, special. That's very that's special. Awesome. So that that's really enough for me. 
Absolutely. Well, uh, yeah, I think I think that's a good place to end. But but Tim, thank yeah. you for, for joining thank us you. and uh, telling us some stories about about how patches get made and and, and the process and and your experience with that. And thank you for designing our our one year anniversary patch. Yes. It feels very special to have someone yes. who's had flown patches uh, design our patch. It means a lot. I'm glad to. I did. I didn't know where you were with the manufacturing process, so I didn't know if you were going to show uh, show the artwork with today's episode. Yeah, we are. So it's the uh, it's the image for the episode. So if you open up your podcast provider, listener, uh, you should see the artwork. But of course, it will be on all our social media as well. I can't wait to see it on Emily's gold flight jacket. Yes, oh, I need to get it. I need to get it put on my flight. I have a few patches and I'm like, I need to finally just get something put on my jacket. And that would definitely be it. So I'm really proud we've done this for a God, a year. It's unbelievable. Yep. And thank you for helping to celebrate that, Tim. Thank you yes. very much. Thank you so much. My pleasure. It's been, a, it's been awesome. Hello, Houston. Apollo 15. The Falcon is on its perch. Well, Emily, I don't know about you. I did not think that in talking about patches, I was going to get emotional. <laughs> I know, me too. I, I really did get a, a bit teary-eyed because I was just thinking, you know, what a legacy that Tim and a lot of his fellow, you know, space patch artists, there's a few of them in Space Hipsters who've had flown space flight art. And um, but that is so cool, having that be your legacy. Like, you could just go to the internet and type in, you know, whatever mission it is, and boom, there's your patch. Yeah. That image is always going to be, like, associated with that particular mission. To me, that's just incredible. Like, the, that is truly, like, that. that's a big legacy, you know, to leave. And plus, you know, the iconography of these patches. Like, when you think about... I'm I'm pulling out sort of a big mission like Apollo 11. What's the first thing? One of the first things you think about is that patch. You think about that eagle. Yeah, you think yeah, about the exactly. eagle with the olive branch. You know. Yeah, exactly. Those things aren't frivolous to me. I think a lot of people, you know, think oh space art, you know, whatever. You know, people tend to blow off sometimes. You know, steam, you know, stuff and art initiatives, but space art is really important because it represents so much of our world. So I'm really glad that Tim talked about that today. Yeah. And also he's just so humble. I love the fact that, that the way these things have been made in the past isn't necessarily through ridiculously high technology. He was talking about old school cutting and pacing and using Microsoft Word and paint. And, and you know, he's upgraded since then, but I love that side of it. And the complete lack of ego of these artists as well. I mean, they're not doing this for fame. They're doing it because they want to be connected to these missions. And I, I just love that. I just love that. No, you don't see it. Their names aren't really on them. Um, the only thing I do notice sometimes, like if you're familiar with like McCall or Tim and stuff, there are particular like sort of trademarks around about their work and stuff. But you're absolutely right. You know, their names aren't on them. You kind of have to know who designed them, you know, and sort of have that knowledge to really know, OK, this so and so did this one. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's like you sort of carry that that mantle, but not everybody knows that exactly so you kind of have to put your ego sort of aside you know it doesn't have a a signature on it exactly yeah and i don't know about you emily but i just love a patch and when i'm at a space museum a big part of the experience is going to the gift shop and just standing in front of the racks of space patches and mission patches and figuring out uh, how I could display them all at home if I were to buy all of them, because, of course, that's what I'd want to do. I've not done it yet, but I've been wanting to do it for ages and just figure out a great wall display for all these beautiful pieces of art. Me too. Uh, I'm just a sucker for patches. Uh, I, I, I bought tons of stuff from Tim. Um, I need to get them mounted into some kind of display, but at this moment, I just have everything kind of... I just collect, which is bad. I need to eventually just break down and actually sort through everything. Um, I'm a sucker for all sorts of patches. I have, for God's sakes, I have all the For All Mankind patches. And that's yeah. not even a real <laughs> space program, you know? So, yeah, I, I love I love patches. Uh, my, God, my latest, last year, one of my projects during the pandemic was to, I wanted like a rare, um, there was a rare Skylab patch that I was searching for. And I think I found it off Amazon or something, you know, just something. Cra I was looking for a specific patch and I was like, Amazon's got it for five bucks. It was from like a vintage store. 
or something. Wow. So just stuff like that is really awesome. You know, it's just, I don't know. I'm a sucker for a patch. Exactly. Like I said, I have patches for stuff that's not even real. So <laughs> yeah. And now you have your own mission patch. Yes, we do. It's awesome. And it's really beautiful. I love it. Yes, it is. And of course, as always, you can watch the full video of this interview on our Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash space and things. And in the show notes, you will find all the information about Tim, his social media, and where you can find out more about his patches. So go and check that out as well as maybe buying one of our patches uh, or joining our Patreon, of course. Uh, but anyway, let's do some news. And from every window, we have a really spectacular view of the Earth and as well as the, uh, what surprised me, the real, real blackness of space. I don't think I've ever seen black as it is out here. And so on to the news from the last two weeks. Um, there have been seven launches since we last spoke. On, on Tuesday, the 10th of August, Northrop Grumman launched a Cygnus cargo ship to the International Space Station called the SS Ellison Onizuka, named after the first Asian-American astronaut who flew to space in 1985 on STS-51C before tragically losing his life on board the Challenger Space Shuttle on January 28, 1986. Uh, naming these cargo ships may seem insignificant, but... I love the fact that they keep doing this, especially when they, they do it as a tribute to one of the pioneers of spaceflight that, that have come through the ages. And this is another great example. I love that they do this. Yep, me too. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so on Thursday, 12th of August, the Indian Space Research Organization tried to launch one of their GSLV Mark II rockets. But unfortunately, there was a major failure of the third stage, which led to the whole mission failure, annoyingly. Uh, and, the, and the satellite was lost. It was the 14th attempted mission of this rocket, which has now had four failures, uh, which is a shame. A timely reminder that space is hard. We also had a launch from Ariane Space in French Guiana, Star Sem in Kazakhstan, and three Chinese rockets. So full details and videos of these launches will be in our show notes. So there have been a number of different developments with regards to the Artemis program over the last few weeks. Apparently, the deadline of landing on the moon by 2024 is under threat because NASA's spacesuits won't be ready in time. The next generation of spacesuits are called the Exploration Extra Vehicular Mobility Units, or XEMUs. According to NASA's current schedule, uh, two of these suits should be ready by November 2024, but there are some big challenges with this. Uh, the delays, apparently caused by COVID-19 impacts, Funding shortages and some other technical challenges have meant there is now a uh, zero schedule margin for the two suits. Therefore, it's unlikely they'll be ready by April 2025 at the earliest. Uh, we understand that a lot of people are very confused by the whole spacesuit issue with regards to spaceflight. So we will be talking to some suit engineers in September, and hopefully this will answer some of your questions. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It should be good. It'll be exciting. And even though the, the 2024 deadline is being blamed on the suits, the Lunar Lander program has once again seen some setbacks as Blue Origin have decided to sue NASA after they lost their appeal about the contract being granted to SpaceX. And this has been dragging on for months now. And as a result of this legal action, work has had to stop on the Lunar Lander. So once again, more delays. It's really great to see how the space industry is working together on this. <laughs> and and yep. I get it. They're private companies and money needs to be made, etc. But the Apollo program also used private contractors to make their machines. And I don't recall ever reading about any dramas like this. It's getting quite annoying, in my opinion. Yep. I agree, and uh, I'll just stop there. I could get started, but uh, if I get started, we're going to be here for a while. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll be here for a few hours. So, uh, some uh, ESA news. A few weeks back, we talked about the fact that there were going to be some fly pasts of Venus by probes destined for Mercury and the Sun. Well, we've had some incredible images and data come back from those flybys. Bepi Colombo, which is headed to Mercury, uh, sent back some stunning images, and it also recorded the sound of solar wind at Venus and made some uh, detailed measurements of Venus's cloudy atmosphere. To be clear, it's slightly misleading because the audio isn't the sound which can be heard in space, but it's a sonification which translates data into sounds, but that's still really cool in our opinion. Yep. 
Um, we've also had a video from the Solar Orbiter, which is really quite something. Now, the images we've received from both aren't incredibly detailed, but these are just bonus images from a, a planet, which we've not really seen up close that many times. Uh, as we've discussed a few months ago, this is all due to change over the next coming decades. And I'm all for it. I can't wait. Yep, me too. Meanwhile, on Mars, Ingenuity completed its 12th flight on the Red Planet. Uh, the little helicopter did a risky flight, apparently, uh, according to the engineers, in which it did some reconnaissance for the Perseverance rover. And meanwhile, Percy has sent back a photo of Mars's tiny moon, Deimos. Uh, and while this isn't the first time we've seen such an image, it's still always, well, it's always special when you see the tiny dot in the sky, because they are tiny. Both the moons on Mars are so small. Um, also, the Chinese Zerong rover has completed its primary mission, which was originally planned to explore the planet for three months, but due to its success, they've decided to keep going. So this is what we like to hear about in the space industry. Absolutely. And speaking of China, uh, two Chinese astronauts or taikonauts on board uh, their new space station have completed their second spacewalk since arriving on board, installing a range of equipment, including a backup air conditioning unit, which is very important. If if uh, any of you live in Florida, you'll know how important AC is. <laughs> uh, Liu Boming and Ni Haxing spent four hours outside after completing all their tasks an hour ahead of schedule. The crew are due to stay on board the station for three months, which will be a Chinese space duration record. Awesome. Yeah, I love that. So another story which you may have seen recently uh, is that SpaceX have been hired to launch a Canadian satellite for Geometric Energy Corp. And the purpose of this satellite is to beam back advertising from space. Now, this has been rather incorrectly <laughs> reported as a meaning that you will look up to the sky and see adverts flying across it. Which, of course, is absurd and ridiculous and isn't what's happening. Uh, but people love to read a headline and make their own conclusions. And they've been using this as a reason for why billionaires shouldn't have space companies and blah, blah, blah. The truth is that this is a tiny CubeSat, which will have a screen and a small selfie stick with a camera. <laughs> and the camera is going to record images of what's on the screen against the background of space and Earth from space. And those adverts will be broadcast on YouTube or Twitch or whatever people watch adverts on these days. Um, it's not something we really need, uh, but it's a far cry from what people have been saying online. And I'm, I'm just getting a bit peeved off at how the space industry is being reported by mainstream press and on social media at the moment. Uh, it's another rant. Um, but, you know, <laughs> uh, are we doing enough to reach out to people and tell them what's really going on and what's important? Or are we continuing to let people make their own ill-informed minds up? It's a problem that we've all got to get, that, that all of us who love space flight and space exploration need to get together to think about because I'm fed up of having discussions on Twitter with people who think they know best because they think that Elon Musk is about to beam adverts back from space. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, clickbait and stuff like that out there. It's really just the bane of my existence. So I It's totally so annoying, agree. isn't it? It is annoying because people contact me about it and they're like, what do you think about this? And I'm like, just read the article. Yeah. It does, you know, read the article. It's not saying what you think it's saying. Don't read the headline, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And finally, while we're talking about SpaceX, the crew of the Inspiration4 mission are now within a month of their mission, and the first trailer is out for the Netflix series, which will start to be aired on September 6th, assuming there are no delays to the launch. Uh, we've spoken about this mission a lot, and if it launches as planned on September 15th, we'll be talking about it a lot more in upcoming episodes, and we are excited. Very excited. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And as a little bit of fun to end this section, uh, Jared Isaacman, the billionaire who funded this mission, is looking for a brewery to make beer with space-flown hops, which he will take with him. Uh, they're taking 70 pounds of hops on this flight, which will be auctioned off with the proceeds uh, and will be donated to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. The whole mission continues to do so much to raise both funds and awareness about what this hospital does. It's really quite special. If you're a brewer, check out inspiration4.com to find out how you can get involved. And that's a sentence I bet you never thought you were going to say. 
Yes, but it's really cool. <laughs> I really like it. Yeah. I mean, it's, some, some will argue that what's the point? You know, it's a waste, you know, sending hops up or whatever, but it's all being done for charity and, and it's something different. And, and why not? Why not? Yeah. It's going to help kids. And that's all I care about. Yeah, that's absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. And uh, I don't know how it all worked out, but apparently it did somehow. But there was things, nothing was going right. You know, I remember from the beginning, nothing fit. We got that stuff, they got the geniuses figuring stuff out to like the nanometer, right? Or whatever, you know, the spot. And it's still not fitting. We're both trying stuff. I don't know what's going on out there, but somehow I think it all worked. That's all we've got this week. We hope you've enjoyed episode 52, and we hope you enjoyed hearing about patches from Tim, and maybe you'll consider purchasing our new anniversary patch, our first anniversary patch. Absolutely. Check it out on our website or join our Patreon to get one. Yep. Thanks again for all your support. It's been a wonderful year, and next week, we've got a very special show to start year two. But right now, don't forget, in space, no one can hear you stream. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.